As a reminder, to find the chat, scroll over the bottom of your screen. You'll see a banner that pops up and on that is a bubble that says chat. When you click on that, the chat feature will launch and it will most likely show up on the right-hand side of your screen. When you use the chat, your questions, comments, or answers will only be seen by our presenter, the team at Arbors, and myself. Again, we encourage your participation, so please use the chat with questions. Now I'd like to ask Camille Shira Mataro to join us to share some information with you. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. The Arbors Assisted Living Communities, we offer independent living, assisted living and reflections memory care. We have respite short-term stays, trial stays, um, and we, are, we help families, caregivers, seniors um, determine if we're the right fit and if our services are for you. So feel free to reach out to our communities, reach out to us if you have any questions at all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Camille, for that introduction. And thank you again to Arbor Assisted Living for sponsoring our program today. Now I'd like to ask you some questions. Do you want to better understand dementia symptoms? Do you want to determine what stage your loved one is experiencing? Or perhaps you want to save money, energy, and time while caregiving? If you answered yes to any one of these questions, you are in the right place. Our presenter this evening is the author of Cruising Through Caregiving, Reducing the Stress of Caring for Your Loved One, and a longtime gerontology instructor at Johns Hopkins University's Certificate on Aging program. A former education consultant with the Alzheimer's Association, she has also been featured in national media such as Forbes, Reader's Digest, Redbook, and the Huffington Post. When she's not speaking and writing about dementia, caregiving, and generational issues, she can be found trying to resist the drive through at Chick-fil-A. Please join me in welcoming from Kent Island, Maryland, Jennifer L. Fitzpatrick. Well, hello everybody, and thank you all for being here this afternoon, this evening for this. It feels like it's getting to be evening now that it's getting darker earlier. Uh, for our program on touring the stages of dementia. So we're gonna go ahead and jump right in. As Kristen mentioned, please feel free to use that chat section. The next hour is all about you and learning and getting what you need to do the best that you can in caring for your loved one who has dementia. So first we're gonna talk a little bit about what dementia looks like because I know there's probably a lot of you on the program who are, have been caregiving for a while for your spouse or your parent or whoever it is that you love. But some of you might be a little bit new and maybe not even sure if your loved one truly does have dementia. So let's talk about that for a moment. Uh, so some red flags that would concern uh, a lot of people about their loved one, maybe can't remember that there's a pandemic going on can't remember that there's recently been lockdowns and, and uh, that there's been some, some issues. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, what's, what's going on in the world, it's at top of mind for everybody. And if you truly can't remember that, that would be a red flag for somebody. So a personality change, you've always been very gentlemanly and now suddenly you're using horrible language with the grandkids. Or maybe you've always had a really terrific sense of humor. You always, you have a group of friends you always can joke around with and suddenly you're not understanding their jokes. Um, maybe still thinking that Obama's president, thinking that Reagan is president, thinking that, that Clinton is president, uh, Bush, one of the Bushes, but not realizing that we've, we've moved past a couple presidents uh, since. Maybe in the winter, and I know where all of you are in New England, um, it, it, when, where you all are in New England, it's uh, getting cold. Uh, I'm in Maryland, Kristen's in New Jersey, so it's still pretty fall here, but uh, I've lived in New England myself, and so I know it can get rather chilly. But, you know, especially next month or in December, uh, wearing um, summer clothes in the winter, or maybe in the summer wearing winter clothes, uh, poor judgment, wearing clothes that are dirty. Maybe they look like they just came out of the hamper. And you notice this on your loved one. So dementia is really an umbrella term. And it's, 
symptoms. So confusion, poor judgment, personality changes. And of course, most of us tend to associate dementia with short-term memory loss. Uh, can't remember what uh, that you just saw your brother yesterday, or you can't remember what's going on in the world, or can't remember what happened on your favorite show that you watched an hour ago. Uh, these symptoms, they can be sometimes, we hope, uh, this is what we're hoping when we have a loved one or a patient, that it's something reversible, that's something that we can treat. But what we're talking today about is primarily the irreversible dementias, the ones uh, that happen and they don't go away. And there's a lot of reasons that someone could have reversible symptoms. And it could be a urinary tract infection, which looks like delirium, dementia-like symptoms. It could be a B12 deficiency. It could be a nutritional deficiency. There, there's so many things that could cause depression for many older adults can cause there to be uh, dementia-like symptoms or pseudo-dementia. Uh, but again, what most of us are worried about today or concerned about, if you have a loved one that you're concerned about, uh, you've gone to a doctor, or if you are concerned about some of the red flags, you will go to a doctor and you'll get them either figured out that they have something that can be fixed, or you're going to be diagnosed with something irreversible like Alzheimer's disease or another type of irreversible dementia. Okay, so mild cognitive impairment. Um, MCI is a decline in one of the following areas, memory, executive function. Uh, there are signs of memory loss and some difficulties, but it's not fully dementia. So I almost call this sort of like normal aging plus. So it's not quite as bad as, as you know, that there's, there's really true signs that it's Alzheimer's or Lewy body or frontal temporal, but it's not normal aging anymore either. And according to NIA, about 80% uh, of people who have MCI eventually within 10 years will develop Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. So what does executive function have to do with planning? So maybe planning Thanksgiving dinner, probably, I, I know I just sort of came up, my family and I just figured out our plans for Thanksgiving, but planning maybe what you're gonna have for dinner, what you're gonna cook, maybe planning a guest list, making decisions, de deciding about maybe what you're gonna wear today, responding to feedback. Maybe somebody says, oh, your hair looks really nice and uh, it, your executive function will give that response or, or help you to come up with what you wanna say as a response. Executive function is also responsible for inhibition and impulse control. And so this is why we see for a lot of people with different types of dementia uh, and particularly Alzheimer's and also frontotemporal dementia, a lack of inhibition. And what that lack of inhibition often equates to is a lack of modesty. Perhaps they're, maybe they've always been a very modest person and now they're leaving the bathroom door open or they're taking off, you're getting changed in front of other people that they normally wouldn't, wouldn't do that to or do that in front of. But it also could be something more along the lines of uh, that somebody says, uh, you know, your hair looks great, but they say, well, your hair looks lousy. Because that inner monologue that says, well, that's socially acceptable, or that's not socially acceptable, is not working quite the way that it should. Now, you certainly can't, you, you certainly want to remember that there are people, and you probably have people like this in your life, that that would be their, their sense of humor to say, oh, your hair looks lousy. Or, or they're just maybe can be mean spirited and say your hair looks lousy. But if it's somebody that always was very polite or controlled and wasn't intentionally trying to be funny or hurt someone's feelings, uh, they can say some really offensive uh, comments to people because they just lack that inner monologue that says, well, that's socially acceptable and that's not socially acceptable. Uh, something else that occurs is an issue with time management. So being able to figure, okay, well, it's, I'm, I'm going to drive to the grocery store and that's going to take me 10 minutes. I'll probably need 20 minutes while I'm there to grab just a couple of items and then 10 minutes to drive back. Uh, they might just not be able to, to plan that way and do that sort of time management. Uh, so also uh, switching between tasks, starting a task, stopping a task, 
evaluating a task. So if you have a loved one who has young onset dementia, this can be a real issue for workplace issues. So I once worked with a family where there was a woman that was an accountant and she was very, very, very good at her job. She was at her job for well over a decade in her mid fifties. And she started to have a really hard time with doing basic math or starting assignments or being able to figure out how much time she needed for an assignment or maybe switching between a phone call and and working on a spreadsheet. And ultimately this individual wound up getting fired from her job, which is just such a tragedy because she didn't, she didn't know what was going on with her. All she knew that she was making a lot of mistakes. Her employer knew she was making a lot of mistakes. And ultimately after she'd been fired from her job, at one point they finally did diagnose her with Alzheimer's disease. And just to, and, I'm, and I'm, if anybody out there has a loved one with young onset, which would be symptoms before age 65, feel free to write in the chat section. It is quite rare, uh, much rarer than getting it later in life, but it does happen sometimes. Uh, so let's talk about the stages. And I'm going to use as our example today, Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of irreversible dementia. So the way that I like to explain that, I <laughs> you've heard from my intro uh, about Chick-fil-A, but I'd like to say, like, let's say dementia is fast food. And there's lots of different kinds of fast food. And it's the same thing. There's lots of different kinds of dementia. So the one, if you're driving on a road trip and you're driving down the highway and you're constantly uh, looking for a place to use the bathroom or get a get an iced tea or, or get a snack, the place that you're going to encounter most, no matter where you are in the United States, is going to be a McDonald's. There's just more McDonald's per capita than any other fast food establishment. Now, <laughs> that is how we look at Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is your most common form of dementia, of irreversible dementia. But vascular dementia is out there. So let's say that's your Burger King. And uh, if you look at frontotemporal dementia, maybe that's your Chick-fil-A. And you look at uh, Lewy body dementia, and maybe that's your Wendy's. You get the idea. So there are other types, but I'm going to focus to talk about the stages. I want to focus on Alzheimer's because it is the most common form of dementia. So in cruising through caregiving, and if Kristen at some point could write in the, the link for cruising through caregiving, cruising through caregiving is my book. And in the book, I talk about the stages of dementia and I make the metaphor of, of them being much like visiting a foreign country without preparation. So I, you may notice there's three flags here. The first one is, is Ireland. The second one is Italy. And the third one is Yemen. So I want you to imagine that your loved one uh, is, or you, let's start with you, that I say to you, you're, you're going to get dropped off at Logan Airport this afternoon or this evening, and we're going to send you to Ireland with no prep. I want, we're going to liken that to the early stages of dementia, of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, with the going to Italy, I drop you off at Logan to go to Italy with no preparation ahead of time. We're gonna liken that to going to Italy with no preparation. And then finally, we're gonna liken the late stages to going to Yemen with no prep. Uh, okay. Okay, so let's, let's dig into that a little bit. So the early stages, what is common? So if you go over to Ireland and you have not prepared, which means you didn't read a bunch of travel books about going to Ireland and you haven't gone and looked at the Rick Steves website and you haven't, you haven't read or, or done anything to prepare or learn about the history, you're gonna get off at Shannon Airport from Logan and you're gonna be fine. You're going to be okay because a lot of Ireland looks much like the U.S. The, they speak English. Uh, they are going to eat foods that are very similar to what we eat. 
In fact, many people from New England are Irish. I am part Irish. My husband is 100% Irish as you. His name is Sean Fitzpatrick. Actually grew up in Boston. Uh, but in fact, when you go to Ireland, there are going to be some differences. So you're probably going to notice that people drink more Guinness. It is greener. There is an accent and they're going to think that you have an accent. But you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. And this is much like when we are around somebody who has the early stages. When someone's in the early stages, they have a lot of moments where they're just like you and I. But then they also have a lot of moments or some, some moments, most of the time during the course of a week, where they're not like you and I, that they aren't expressing themselves the same way. They're not remembering the same way. But there's going to be a lot of times where they're going to meet somebody who has absolutely no idea that they have Alzheimer's. So struggle with word finding. Now, I don't want to alarm anybody because we all have issues with word finding. We call that tip of the tongue moments as we get older. But maybe you're trying to think of a movie you watched last week and you really loved it and you had its older movie. You haven't seen it in a while. Uh, but oh gosh, it's one of my favorites. Steve Carell is in it and Julianne Moore is in it and it's uh, Crazy Stupid Love. But you can't remember the name of the movie for another hour. That's okay. You don't want to worry about that. But if I say, what would you like for breakfast? And you say light bulb. And then I say to you, uh, how was your day? And you say water. That might be a sign that something's really off. And that's something that commonly happens during the early stages of Alzheimer's. Often the person is aware that something is not quite right, that it is off um, losing items, unable to retrace steps. So if you're watching, if you happen to be watching This Is Us, the show, there is a character who has Alzheimer's disease. And the, in terms of This Is Us, uh, one of the criticisms that I have about it is that just losing the phone is, is meant to be a sign that this individual is suffering. But really, uh, it would be more that you really truly can't retrace your steps. So say you lose your cell phone, the first thing that most of us are going to do is say, okay, where was I last? Was I in my car? Was I, uh, was I at the grocery store? Was I at a friend's house? Was I in the backyard? You're going to be able to do that. And you're going to be able to figure out it. Maybe you won't find it immediately, but you'll be able to retrace your steps. In the early stages of Alzheimer's, your loved one is, is not really capable of doing this. And so remember your loved one is a lot of times they're with us and then there's times when they're not with us. So it can be tricky. Now, I was at an event a couple of years ago and I was the speaker and there, my name was up on the stage on this big screen with the title of the event. And there was a woman in the audience who called me over. And this was a family caregiver event, much like we're doing right now courtesy of Camille. And this woman calls me over and she says, hi, hon, your name is Fitzpatrick. And she told me the name, she had a friend named, last name Fitzpatrick. And she said, is there any relation? They're from this town. And I said, oh no, you know, it's my husband's name. We've been married for a long time, but I don't know that person. It, it can be a common name. And uh, so I went ahead after that, went back, did my event. And then at the end, uh, this woman, I called me over again and I went over to her and she repeated the exact same story and the exact same question. Well, here she was there with her husband. She was the one that had dementia, but I can tell you that I had no clue, no idea. All these years that I've been working in dementia care, and I didn't know because she had a lot of moments. She was dressed beautifully. She was walking around talking to people. I thought she was there as a family caregiver. And then when I saw her there with her husband, I understood. But that is a classic case of, you know, and you might see this sometimes with your loved one. You take them to the doctor. All of a sudden they seem fine. 
And it can be very frustrating because it's not that we don't want them to have moments where they feel great and, and their brain's working well, but we want the doctor to see what we're seeing and what we're concerned about. So absolutely, uh, this is, this is uh, again, much like visiting Ireland with no prep. If you have not un educated yourself or understood, and I applaud you for joining our program today because this is a great way to better understand what to expect as time goes by. So the early stages can be, be, be two years, three years, four years, sometimes even longer. The average duration of Alzheimer's is about nine to 10 years. So it can last quite a bit of time, but we never know how long someone's gonna remain in one stage. So let's move um, in, into what do we do during the early stages? We want to encourage diagnosis. If you're not sure what's going on with your loved one, I want you to please try to get him or her diagnosed. What is going on? And maybe it could be possible if you don't know yet, it is possible that maybe there is something happening that can be treated. Or on the other hand, if it's not, if it's not depression, if it's not an infection, if it's not a B12 deficiency, well then, we want the doctor to be working with them to figure out what medicine might be helpful. Maybe talking to your loved one and figuring out while they're still in those early stages, uh, advanced planning for money, for their will, for their trust, for their advanced directives. So we really wanna encourage that early diagnosis. The person that you love who is in the early stages, well, no matter what stage he or she is in, they are an adult, but in the early stages, especially, you want to work with them as much as possible and allow them to have as much input as is safe and as is comfortable because they are still a grown up. And in a lot of ways, they might still have capacity to make some of their decisions. Your loved one with dementia is always a grown up. I have a whole chapter of cruising through caregiving just about that. The fact that your older loved one is an adult, they are a grown up. We wanna encourage them during this time, be proactive. And this is one of the reasons that, that you wanna be thinking about, okay, they're, they're in the early stages today. They're in Ireland today. Well, what if they get to, to Italy? What about when they get to Yemen? And this is why you wanna be looking at community like Camille's, like, like the Arbors, because you may, even if things are great today, they might be great today, they might be great for the next six months, two years, three years, but someday it's very possible you're going to need senior living or you're going to need some additional help. So it might be important at this time to talk about what are, if you ever did need to move, what would be amenities that would be really important to your loved one? Or is it, is there a prior priority? I want to be within 10 miles of my grandkids, or I want to make sure that I'm in a community with certain types of hobbies or activities, but being proactive and letting that person share and, and sort of work on items that are on their bucket list that maybe at some point they're not going to be able to do anymore. Help clarify for your loved one in this stage. Um, now, a lot of we a lot of professionals in our field talk about reality orientation. Oh, it's so terrible to do that if somebody says, "Oh, okay, well, Fourth uh, of July is coming up. We should plan for a barbecue." Uh, in in families, a lot of times will say, "No, it's not. Thanksgiving is coming up." I think that when someone's in the early stages, they are sometimes seeking clarification. And so they may welcome you to say, oh dear, it really, it, you know, we actually had 4th of July a couple months ago and we're, we're moving toward Thanksgiving. Now, some people in the early stages don't like this. It's not gonna go well. Uh, their memory, they're having a moment where they're going to reject that it's almost Thanksgiving. So be very careful if you do use reality orientation or clarification for your loved one in communicating, know that sometimes it's not going to be welcome. Know that I recommend trying it once. And if they push back and say, nope, it's 4th of July, we got a plan for 4th of July, I would go with that. 
But I think the only time that reality orientation really makes any sense at all in Alzheimer's or dementia care is in the early stages. And please, please feel free. This time is yours. If you have questions, if you have something going on specific with your loved one that you want some clarification on or discussion on, please feel free to write in because I, I guarantee somebody else that's here who's caregiving has the same question. Um, and, and please feel free to write in the chat section, use that chat, chat section and Camille and I would be happy to, to, to get into these issues with you in more depth, something that might be more important or personal to you. So mid stages of, of Alzheimer's, again, I liken it to visiting Italy with no preparation. So you didn't prepare to go to Italy. You didn't read the Rick Steves books. You didn't download the app for Italian to English to your iPhone. What do you do? You get over there. And if you're going to a rural area, say the Tuscany area, which I've been, don't speak a whole lot of English. They don't speak a whole lot of English. They are much more Italian, they, you know, and, and of course, I, when, when we Americans, a lot of times we get somewhere and we expect everybody to speak English and, and they really don't in more rural sections. But you're still going to be, there's going to be moments where you're going to be really uncomfortable. And then there's going to be moments where you're really comfortable. And here's why, because you're going to get to Italy and it's going to be gorgeous. The architecture is going to look beautiful, but you're going to, it's going to be familiar because there's a lot of architecture like that, that has been utilized in the United States. Uh, the food is certainly going to look familiar. The food's so delicious. Uh, you are going to, if you took a romance language in high school, even if you don't speak English, you're probably going to pick up some words here and there, and you're going to be able to communicate, but you're going to be able to communicate by body language and facial expressions and gesturing. So if you say, want your bill at a cafe, you would just scroll into the, into the sky. Uh, and if you want a beverage, you might do this with your hands, but you're still going to have moments of discomfort because you don't know everything about the culture. You don't know everything about the language if you're not prepped well. And I liken this very much to the mid stages of Alzheimer's disease. And the mid stages, if the early stages that there's a lot of time that they're like you and I, and then there's moments where they are not like you and I, mid stages is, is more, I would say 50-50 or worse on behalf of the individual with dementia not being like us. So we see more wandering. So we see people walk out of their homes in the middle of the night thinking that they have to go to work and they haven't worked in 20 years. Delusions, uh, one common one, and I'm sure Camille has seen this at her community. Uh, I've seen so many examples of an older person just believing that their daughter is stealing from them or their son is stealing from them but here the daughter or the son are paying. Not only are they not stealing from the loved one, they're paying for the loved one to live in the community, but it's just a false belief. There's paranoid delusions, seeing something that's not there, thinking there's a burglar in their apartment. And this loved one has a really, really hard time understanding you and you have an even harder time understanding them. There's more challenges with activities of daily living. And so, um, using a fork or brushing your teeth, that, that becomes more difficult. And I think most people, when they hear Alzheimer's or they hear dementia, they, they get the piece of short-term memory loss. Like, I'm not going to remember that I just took a walk 15 minutes ago. I don't remember that I was just outside in the fresh air. But they have a hard time understanding about the delusions and the hallucinations and that the person's brain is not reminding them how to pick up a cup anymore or how to hold a toothbrush. So all of that can be very, very, very hard. So I liken the mid stages of Alzheimer's to, to going to Italy without preparation. And if you're going into that rural area where you're just, you have a lot of moments, a lot of moments where it's not comfortable and it's tough. And again, this is why we really want to encourage everybody to just try to learn as much as they possibly can about their loved one's condition. So 
uh, because your loved one, I can all but guarantee they would love to be like us. They would love for their brain to work properly, but it's just not happening. We don't have a cure right now. And the later stages, uh, I liken very much to visiting uh, Yemen. And if you go to Yemen with no prep, you are going to have a very rough time. It is a very undeveloped country. The laws are extremely different than they are in the United States. Women's rights are very different than they are in the United States. The language is completely different. And if you haven't studied Arabic, you are going to not get it. The body language is different. Making certain gestures can be considered very insulting and perhaps even get you into some legal trouble. So I liken the late stages to visiting Yemen. And the late stages, if we have not prepared uh, learning about Alzheimer's, the late stages are just absolutely jarring. Uh, we have somebody just wrote in, I find it odd, my mother knows she has memory issues, but then she gets upset if we try to suggest that any issue she's having is due to the memory. So it's very common. Some, just a couple of thoughts on what might be happening with your mom. One thing that might be happening is that she, it might be that she just agrees sometimes when you say, well, you know, mom, you've got some memory issues, or she might say, oh, I know my memory is shot. She might say something like that. But then a little bit later, she's having less of a moment of clarity. And when you remind her, then she gets frustrated or she gets angry. My recommendation to you, if you're finding this, if she insists she gets right and she gets upset is back off. The worst thing that we can do in communicate. So when I said reality orientation in the beginning, reality orientation, like mom, oh, I know you have memory issues, you know that. As soon as she says, no, I don't, I don't have memory problems. I recommend pivoting and doing what I call course correcting. Be like, oh, okay, and redirect her, change the subject, talk about something else, put on music, put on a movie, go take a walk. Because one, it could be that she's struggling with it, like that she's really having a foggy moment that she doesn't truly, she sort of remembers that she has a memory problem, but then she kind of does it. But it also could be she just does not believe you, that she's like, that's wrong. And it's almost like me trying to tell you that, you know, if, you're, if your hair is blonde and I'm like, your hair is, is brown and you're saying, no, it's not, it's blonde. There's nothing I can do to change your mind. And that's how your mother is sometimes feeling. So when, if you utilize reality orientation or correcting, which I don't really recommend ever past early stages, but if you do it, pull back if they push back. If they say, nope, you pull back because you're just going to get into an argument. You're just going it, to, and it's going to be very upsetting to your loved one. Yeah, and if anybody has any other examples or thoughts, please feel free to write in. We really want you to get as much as you can out of, of this time we have together. So the late stages of Alzheimer's include really unable to do any activities of daily living. Most people in the later stages, they can't even get up from a chair to go to the bathroom. They're usually incontinent. They can't get up from a bed. They have, you know, they really, really struggle with mobility. Uh, very increased dependence on other people for everything, for everything. That means getting out of bed. That means eating if they're still able to eat. That means, uh, that means just about anything that they might want, they might need, whether they need a blanket. So when my grandfather was dying of cancer, he did not have Alzheimer's, he did not have dementia at all. Uh, but at end of life, there was a whole bunch of us, you know, in the last couple of days of his life at the hospital. And at one, there's probably, I wanna say about 10 of us in his hospital room and we were all, he was a great guy. 
the most loving person and just awesome. And he never yelled at anybody, never raised his voice. And he sat up for a moment and said, everyone get the hell out. Pardon my language, but that's exactly what he said. And we all sort of kind of laughed because it was so unlike him. He was telling us, get out. I want peace and quiet. He wanted to rest. So we all left. When someone has Alzheimer's disease, they don't have that language. Their inability to use words is almost completely gone. And you got to realize that way they're going to communicate with you, if they want everybody out, like let's say my grandfather had Alzheimer's and he couldn't tell us with his voice what he wanted to, to us to do, he might have just turned his head and hid his head, or he might have covered his face, or he might have started yelling or screaming or pushing stuff off of his nightstand. So there could be a lot of ways that someone's communicating. I helped take care of my grandmother-in-law when she was dying many years ago. And she, again, she also could, you could tell us what she wanted. She had, she had cancer, but she could tell us what she needed and she didn't want up until the last couple of days. And if she was hot, she would say, can I have a fan? Can you put the air conditioning on? Somebody who has Alzheimer's is gonna maybe throw the blanket on the floor or scream or cry out. So you're going to get nonverbal responses. And so you can see like going into late stages without prep, without understanding is going to be as jarring as being in Yemen with no prep. Okay, we had somebody write in, um, dad has accused my husband of stealing, stealing something from him doesn't want to see my husband anymore. Not sure how to handle this because of the holidays. Okay. So I am going to suggest something that is probably going to be very controversial, but I might keep your husband away from him for a little bit. I also, that might be one suggestion or you try to have them together. At, you know, if it's at the holidays and if your dad seems upset with your husband, Maybe your husband can go into a different room for a while or your dad can go into a different room for a while. If you can be more specific about what he thinks your husband stole and or what your husband's reaction is when he says this, I can give you a little bit more feedback. I, okay, then we have another, but please do, because I, I can definitely give you some more feedback. I'd love to do that. If you tell me what the, the delusion is, what does he think your husband stole? And then uh, how do you all handle it when he accuses your husband? Okay, so then if somebody just wrote in, mom, your mom can't wash or dress herself. She can't complete a thought verbally and, and can't really speak. And I'm very sorry. It's, it's so incredibly difficult to communicate. The further down the road that somebody gets with Alzheimer's, the less we can understand them and the less they can understand us. And so this leads to exhaustion and burnout. And you're exhausted, but think about it. Your brain works properly. Think about how exhausted they are. And that is why you want to be looking at resources, the arbors. If you want to be at Arbor's Assisted Living, if you want, you know, you need to bring some help into your home, friends and family and neighbors, if you need to talk to a support group, and I know that Camille can recommend some to you, I know that she can. If you want to read more or go to Alzheimer's Association's uh, classes as well. Um, okay, so, okay, so Barbara's saying your dad thinks that your husband stole his old coin collection and your husband tries to defend himself. Okay. You're probably not gonna like my recommendation here, but what I would say to try to do is for your husband to apologize. Defending himself is not, it's never, it's almost never gonna work. Reason and rational conversation typically does not work with somebody who's got a delusion, who has Alzheimer's disease, okay? 
or another type of irreversible dementia. I have a colleague who had a patient accuse him of sleeping with his wife. And my colleague said to him, I'm very sorry. And the patient dropped it. And think about that. Think, think about that. That is, you know, it's kind of a scary thing for a professional to, to hear that from a patient because that's all kinds of professional ethical issues and everything. But it de-escalates. So believe me, Barbara, I know your husband probably is like, I am not, a, I didn't do anything to him. I didn't, but I would consider trying it. It's very hard to not take this personally. It's very hard to not take this personally. But the other thing is if your husband is gonna, you said your husband's crushed, it might be a good idea for them to just be apart for a little while. And it might be good to rethink how you're gonna do the holidays. Maybe it's time to do things a little bit differently. Maybe having a big family gathering or maybe just go see your dad for a little bit. I don't know what the arrangements or the circumstances are where your dad lives, but, or how that would be. But I would, the other thing to keep in mind is even if, let's say you brought out that coin collection, you have it, here it is, dad. Sometimes, even if you do that, it's not going to be enough because it's just a delusion in the brain. We don't completely understand why people with Alzheimer's, pardon me, um, we don't completely understand why they focus on cheating and stealing and poisoning. Uh, we don't totally understand, but it's almost never a good idea to try to use rational thought and reasoning. And I gotta tell you, it's hard for me because I'm a pretty rational person. And when I first got into this field, I, I had a hard time with that because I'm all about being honest and being rational and logical. And it just, it just doesn't tend to work. Uh, sometimes it can work in the very, very early stages. The person that wrote in about mom can't dress, wash herself, complete a thought, she is mobile. She's probably in the mid stages or she's between mid and late. Uh, somebody else wrote in something similar that the sp your, your spouse is accusing you of stealing. I know it's not easy to hear. I know that it's not, but apologizing. The other piece of this, and I know that a lot of people are going to say there's no way I'm doing that, and I get it, but it can be very soothing, very soothing. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're having a really lousy day. And you go to uh, check into a hotel, for example, or go for a reservation at a restaurant. And you get there and they're like, we're going to have you. I'm, I'm sorry, your room's not ready. I'm sorry, your table's not ready. And you're like, are you kidding me? And you're really frustrated and you're upset. And they're like, I am so, so sorry. Can we offer you a beverage or can we get you a cup of coffee? I'm so sorry. Don't, even if they didn't really do anything wrong. Don't you sort of feel like yourself like deflating? One of one of the worst things, like have you ever been on the phone with like your your cell phone company or, or your cable company and you're ranting and raving and you're telling them it's not working. I need it to work. I'm working from home. And it's it's like no one ever says, I'm really sorry this is happening. And it's almost like it gets you more ramped up. Does this resonate with anybody? And you just want someone to empathize with you. I think that that's what your loved one needs. Just, I'm sorry you're having a bad day. I'm sorry you're upset. Even if you don't wanna say, I'm sorry I stole your coins. But the other piece of it is a lot of times the person who is obsessing about these paranoid delusions, like you're stealing, you're cheating, you're poisoning me. A lot of times they're, they're bored. And there's the apathy is what's causing them to focus. And so we're going to, let's talk for a few moments about that, but feel, please write in if, if you have any other thoughts or if you're, even if you want to just say, Jen, you're crazy, I would never apologize. That makes no sense to me. It's okay if you think that, but, but I want you to think about it if, if you do feel that way. 
So remember, this is my nephew Enzo. Uh, the person with dementia is much like a small child, much of their languages, but remember they're always an adult. We wanna treat them with dignity. So we want to validate, be in the moment where they are. And so you don't, if you don't want to apologize about the coin collection, say it sounds like you got the coins on your mind. What do the coins remind you of? Naomi Files books are really good about validating, redirecting. You know what, dad, we're going to go for a walk right now. Dad, we're going to put on Gone with the Wind. Dad, we're going to put on, uh, you know, holiday music do something with your loved one. Engage in some kind of preventive activity. Your loved one might not be able to talk in full sentences anymore, but they might be able to take a walk and appreciate the foliage. They might be able to dance still, even though they can't speak in full sentences. Put on music that they like that moves them. Don't correct. No, dad, I didn't steal your coins is probably not gonna work. And I know that that's very frustrating. Don't argue. Don't expect what's working today to always work forever. So some of you might be on the program right now and you're saying to yourself, oh boy, a lot of these people are having a lot of trouble. I'm not having those troubles. I'm glad to hear it, but you might at some point. So whatever's working today, maybe you're committed to keeping your loved one home indefinitely. And that might work for the next six months or a year or two years, but know that at some point you might need adult day. You might need help in the home. You might need the arbors. Sue says, we fib it with mom all the time. If she talks about when her mom is coming home, we don't correct her. Her mom died 30 years ago. Why bring up a traumatic moment? And we won't tell her that if her husband dies, we're not going to tell her. We try to live in her world because she can't live in ours. Sue, thank you. Beautifully said. And I'm guessing, Sue, that you didn't always do that. Did you have to learn that? Did you have to make some mistakes? I would love to hear if, if you always just naturally knew to fib it. So fib, we call that the therapeutic fib, the lie, that therapeutic lies. So we'll wait, we'll hopefully Sue will write in. But one thing that I always recommend is going to a support group because you will see and hear yourself in other people going through what you went through. So navigating mid to late, just like Sue beautifully articulated, you have to go where they are. They are not gonna be able to go where you are. Uh, oh, Sue, that's great. You and your siblings have taken part in different seminars and you've read a lot about the disease to learn. I applaud you for that. And this is why you are not feeling like you're in Italy or Yemen because you've, you're educating yourself. That's excellent. You gotta resist the power struggle. It's a power struggle when you wanna fight with them about the coins, even though you're right. And I know that your husband didn't take them. I know that but you gotta resist the power struggle. No matter the gender of either party, the person with dementia or the caregiver, I want you to think about connecting with your loved one as though it's two dudes watching football. What do I mean by that? So I'm not saying that every man is like this, but I am gonna give an example of my husband, Sean. So a couple of years ago, my husband, Sean, was meeting up with his friend, um, I'll call him Joe, and Joe had just broken up with his girlfriend, and they were going to watch a football game, and when Sean got home, I said, how's Joe doing, and he says, oh, he's fine, we had a good time, I said, oh, no, well, what about Mary, you know, the, the girl that he broke up with, how's he feeling about it, what happened? And Sean's like, I don't know. We didn't talk about it. I'm like, well, what did you do? And he said, well, we watched the game. And right there, it was such a lesson for me in dementia connecting. Because again, I'm not saying all men are like this, but two men 
often can watch a football game together and enjoy one another's company and they don't have to have deep conversations. It's the same idea when you've got a son and a mom, mom has Alzheimer's, son does not. What can they do together? Can they watch a game? Can they watch an old movie? Can they take a walk? Can they work in the garden? Can they go have a meal together? Can they go watch the grandsons play soccer? Doing something together. I think a lot of times we expect our loved one with dementia to still be able to have those conversations that they used to. And so I think it's really important to think about how can you, can, are you gonna dance together? Are you going to do a crossword puzzle together, even though maybe he or she can't do it properly anymore? Are you going to paint her nails? Are you going to give her a hand massage? Something you can do together without a lot of conversation, especially mid-stage and beyond, because your loved one can still do things and be distracted and have joy, moments of, of joy and fun and laughter without having a deep conversation or answering your questions properly. Uh, Sue says, your mom has been at the Arbors for three and a half months. They've provided a wonderful environment with activities. Boredom at home was not her friend. She wouldn't get involved with anything we proposed. Thank you for sharing that, Sue. And Sue, you know, the other thing I wanna say is when we propose items for somebody to do, um, I wanna encourage everybody in getting your loved one involved in activities to not ask, to make a declarative statement. We are going to watch a movie now. Sit down, put the movie on. If she walks away, you have your answer. We are gonna go dig in the garden. Let's go and, and get up and start walking toward the garden. If she doesn't wanna do that, she will demonstrate that. She'll walk away or she'll turn her head or she'll maybe fold her arms. She'll use the, her skills Maybe not verbal, but to tell you what she does or doesn't want to do. So don't say, would you go like to go watch the grandkids ballet recital? Go. I mean, and, and this, listen, a lot of activities like that aren't always going to be appropriate anymore, depending on what stage your loved one is. But a lot of them are. But if she doesn't do well, or she's she walks out or, you know, something like that, then you can course correct. But your loved one most likely Apathy, like Sue said, is not your loved one's friend. The more that they're engaged with some type of activity that captures his or her attention, where they don't feel like they're being drilled with questions, that is going to be really therapeutic for him or her. So uh, just a few resources, in addition to the programs that the Arbors puts on for you, uh, your local area agency on aging, your Alzheimer's Association, your Alzheimer's Association Helpline, 800-272-3900. Um, if your loved one has Lewy body dementia, lbda.org, frontotemporal dementia, the aftd.org. Uh, we are HFC, which is actually in Connecticut, uh, which is the Nonprofit started by Seth Rogan and Lauren Miller Rogan. Lots of support groups, lots of services, care grants are available through them. And then some additional books. I'd love for you to look at Cruising Through Caregiving. And if you go to cruisingthroughcaregiving.com, you can get all the worksheets completely for free, all the assessments. But in addition to that, you can get the first chapter. But these are a couple of others, really good ones. The 36-hour day, validation breakthrough, where the light gets in, and Dr. Ruth's guide to the Alzheimer's caregiver. I particularly think the Dr. Ruth one is great for spouses, and the where the light gets in one is really good for adult children. So I want to thank you all so much for being here today with us, and I want to thank the Arbors for inviting us to, to share uh, in this conversation and feel free to write in any last comments or questions. We're going to keep that chat open. But in the meantime, I'm going to open it back up to Camille. And thank you, Camille. We'll let you wrap us up. And then Kristen will finish up with the housekeeping. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you all for joining us. I hope you did get something today. Thank you for all of your input and feedback. It's nice that we can all support each other um, and help each other with communication with our loved ones and caring for our loved ones. Feel free to reach out 
with any additional questions you might have if we can help in any way at all. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for that informative presentation. And thank you, Camille, for being with us today and to Arbor's Assisted Living for sponsoring this program. This concludes our presentation. We appreciate you being here today. Thank you again, have a wonderful week, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.